Philippians chapter 4. And I've got just a few minutes here to think of a title for this sermon. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. It says, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for the blessings that you brought, in us, brought here, us here safely. And uh, we just ask that as we've gathered here that you will speak to us, that you will use this sermon to, to Speak to our hearts in, in, in my own feeble way as I try to bring out this sermon. We just ask that you would uh, uh, give me abilities beyond myself that I might preach your word. We just ask that you would forgive me of my sins that I might perform this great task. And we would ask that you would be honored and glorified and that souls would be saved from the preaching of your word. All these things we ask in the name of your precious son, Jesus, uh, that you might receive all the glory. Amen. Amen. Philippians 4, 7. I'm going to preach on the peace of God this morning. The peace of God. You know, we live in a, and uh, once again, like I said this morning, I'm not going to shock you, I don't think, with any, anything I'm about to say. Uh, we live in a world where there is really no peace. Uh, there are maybe brief moments where uh, the news isn't as bad as sometimes it is others. But there's, uh, you know, wars going on everywhere. There's turmoil. There, there's, there's crime. Uh, there's hatred. We've got a, a government that has turned away from the word of God. And uh, um, they are doing the exact opposite of what God has told us to do. And we see all this turmoil in life. But here is Paul speaking of the peace of God. Now, this isn't some obsolete thing. This isn't something that, well, yeah, that was true in Paul's day. I think a lot of times people will do that. They'll take something out of the Bible and they'll say, well, things are different now. No, things are not different. People are still wicked. People have all turned against God. Uh, Jesus told the people of his day that, that they loved darkness rather than light. Um, Many times I, I think we may know more about it because our, our ability to uh, get information out is a lot better. Um, there was a um, magazine, a, a, basically a newspaper that was very popular. And I'm trying to think of what the, what, what the name of it was. Basically it was a weekly sports magazine. I can't think of the name of uh, uh, off the top of my head. And it's really not important, but it would come out. And people back in the day would read this magazine. They would get their, their, their stories on how a game went. They went, uh, you know, because things weren't on TV as much as they are now. Uh, there was some radio. Uh, but they would get the box scores and all these other things. That, as far as I know, that, that, that newspaper is long gone. Uh, we've got the, the age where you can find out a score. Uh, if a, a, a ball game was going on right now, I could, after the service, go on out and, and get on my phone and find out what the score and who won that game. Um, so uh, people think that perhaps maybe the, the Bible was obsolete. But Jesus said that heaven and earth would pass away, but his words would not pass away. I'm just saying that to, to say that what Paul said in his day still applies to us today. Uh, the Christians today can rest on the promises that were made back in the day when the Bible was written down. Not only in Paul's day, because that was towards the end of the, the writing of the Bible, uh, all the way back to the oldest book, which is the book of Job, we can still count and believe and trust. Now, once again, I'm sure you all know this, uh, probably every time you hear somebody preach on the book of Philippians, they have to bring up that Paul was in prison when he wrote this book.
But the, the uh, and we always talk about how the, the theme of this book is joy. And I was thinking about it as, yes, it is joy, but we also read about peace. What we're uh, talking about today, we hear about commitment or, or contentment, rather. Uh, commitment's important, too, but we hear about, and this is a book that, that he has written. He's in jail. He's talking about joy and peace and contentment. He's talking about the peace of God. He said it passeth all understanding. In other words, we have peace beyond what the world can understand. I was talking, uh, talking to Brother Don this uh, morning after service, and I was talking about how I was watching a, 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 uh, a movie last night. I think Brother Raymond brought up a... a uh, uh, something. I said, well, I was watching this movie last night and uh, was talking about this movie and the movie was called Unbroken. It was a true story as much as, you know, a movie is. They, they always embellish uh, when they, whenever they make these movies. But it was about a man and I can't remember his, his, his name. Apparently he grew up Catholic. He uh, won the state, uh, set a record for this, the, the state, uh, the, the fastest uh, mile as a, as a runner, this was back in the 30s, uh, went to the Olympics, won a gold medal in the Olympics, and then when the uh, war came, World War II came, he was called into service. Um, he ended up, I, I, uh, uh, his, his plane was shot down. Somehow he managed to get a whole, into a life raft, and he was out on the ocean for 47 days just floating there, and uh, uh, sharks and other predators were coming, the sun would, you know, come up on him, and somehow, and we know why, we know how, this man survived. What, how do we know? Because it passeth all understanding, but he was captured by the Japanese. He was tortured. He had one particular guard that was particularly cruel to him. So when the war is over, he's, uh, uh, finally gets to go home, but he's having trouble dealing with his problems. Uh, he gets, uh, uh, um, becomes an alcoholic. He's drinking all the time. He'd gotten married. He was, his situation at home was not great because of his, his problems that he had. He would, had nightmares every night about the things that he endured. Finally, his wife had had enough. She told him she was divorcing him. They had a little uh, baby at the time, a little, uh, a, a, a little girl. And uh, she was leaving him. And she went to the Billy Graham crusade. And she had, all, uh, she had, had a, a Christian background and she had prayed, but apparently she had never been saved. Or, or if she had, she, she really wasn't living. But anyway, she goes to the Billy Graham crusade. She hears Billy Graham preaching and she goes home and, and tells her drunken husband, I'm not leaving you. I love you. That's what the power of the word of God can do. It gave her the strength and the fortitude to stick it out. So she continued to pray for this man and, and talk to him and she convinced him to go and hear Billy Graham preach. And... Uh, he made a, a, his a general altar call, you know, and uh, this man had heard enough. This sermon had stepped on every little toe, every nerve that he had, and every head was bowed, every eye was closed, and he goes to walk out. And Billy Graham says, do not walk out. And he stopped in his tracks. And God spoke to his heart at that time. And he came back in and he responded to the invitation and he kneeled and he gave his heart and his life and everything to God. What does that have to do with this sermon? From that point on, he had peace within. The alcohol was gone. This one particular guard that he hated, the one that, that, that was the worst on him, he, in his heart, he wanted to go back to Japan, find this man, 
and end his life. Finally, in 1950, he gets the opportunity. They had rounded up several of the Japanese prison guards. And they called him to come in and see if this was this one man they refer to as the bird. If he was among these prisoners so they could convict him and try him and perhaps execute him. And he went and he looked. And he said, no, he's not here. But if you do find him, he hands the man a Bible. And I can't remember the verse he said. He said, tell him to look at this verse. I remember it being in Matthew. And basically it said that we love and forgive our enemies. Because God has forgiven us. And he walked out. And then at the end of the, uh, and, and another guard had stood up and apparently he knew him. And he shook his hand. He said, it's all right. And he walked on out. And when they, they were showing the credits, they were showing the testimony of this real man. He had, he had gotten saved. He had went to work for the, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Services. And he worked a, and ran a boys camp. And uh, juvenile delinquents, he came and he witnessed to and he, he taught them that they were important and, and showed them the love of God. And got their lives, many of them, back on track. But he said once he started praying for that man that he hated, he never had a single nightmare. That is the peace that passeth all understanding. And I didn't mean to share that with you tonight. Uh, I went on a little tangent then, but I think it ties in with why we can have peace in our situation. Let's look, finally, at the situation of peace. It is not dependent on our situations. Paul said here in the same chapter, uh, verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want, but I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Remember, this man was a prisoner. And he said, I've learned. Here I am in prison. I've learned to be content. This philosophy is impractical in the fact that it doesn't make sense. It is the peace of God and it surpasses all understanding. The world cannot understand. Many that proclaim to know Christ have never got to that point where they have the peace of God so much upon them that in spite of their situation, it is well with their soul. He was imprisoned. He didn't have, you know, a lot of people complain about uh, some of the prisons today. They, they, they've got, they've got uh, exercise yards and TV, cable TV and libraries and all these other. No, when you were in prison back then, many times you were chained to a Roman soldier. You had those cold stone walls about you. There was the, the, the food was terrible. There was nothing good. But he had the peace of God. He was able to say rejoice in the Lord always. He had contentment where he was because he knew where he was was in the will of God. And God was using that. He was impoverished. Here was a man who uh, at one point in his life would have been a fairly wealthy man. He had everything in, in that society would have wanted. He was respected. He, he, he had power. He had uh, possessions. He had it all what the world sells. But now that he was in prison, he had peace. Had the peace of God. He knew his life was more than all those other things. This peace is also impregnable. It cannot be defeated. When you have, when you have a, a, a peace uh, in other things, those things vanish. The things uh, of the world fade away. 
But when you have, your, 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 your life is built upon the rock that we always sing about with the kids. You have the peace of God. And it surpasses all understanding. The situation of the peace is it does not matter. The source of the peace is God. Paul refers to it as the peace of God. It's not my peace. It's not uh, uh, something that I, you know, it, it, it is merely just another gift of God. A gift that only believers have. How do we have that peace? Why was Paul able to have that peace and so many that profess Christ do not have that peace? Well, verse 8 kind of explain, uh, talk, tells a little about it. It's what we think about. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are, are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, Think on these things. Many times we do not have the peace of God because we dwell on the negative. We dwell on, on, on all the things that are going wrong. We dwell on all the problems. We dwell on our personal problems. We, we, we uh, dwell on our national problems. We see people around having problems and we look at all the gloomy things and I'm not saying that we need to be ignorant of the problems around us. But remember, remember all those good things as well. Remember the, the, the things that have virtue. Remember those that love God enough that they died for their faith. Remember those, those uh, um, as a matter of fact, the whole reason why we can meet here and gather together and not in some basement is because all of those that came before us and suffered the suffering for us. Men and women, children gave their lives that we could stand here and worship together. What we think about is important to the peace of God. What we do, verse 9 also says, these things ye have both learned and received and heard and seen me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So not only think about all the good things, but look and see what we do. If we do good things, if we do good things, we will have the peace of God. Now, many people will say, well, if you do good things, good things will happen to you. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul did good things. He's in prison. Many of the other apostles uh, at this point had given their lives. Jesus went about doing good according to the book of Acts. He was crucified. It's not saying if you do good things, good things will happen to you. We think that God owes us a good life if we do good things. No, that's not what he says at all. It says you will have the peace of God. You will know that you have done right. Problem is when we have problems in our lives, many times we think of those things that we, that we did that were not good things. And we feel like we're being punished for it. Those things crop up into our heads and we, and we think, I'm getting paid back for something I did in the past or something that, some secret sin perhaps that's in my life. When you do good things, you are content because you know that you are not being punished for something you've done. And by the way, we're not anyway. Our sins are forgiven. It also hinges on what we believe. Verse 6 is be careful for nothing. Today we say don't worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. 
When you make your request and you pray to God and you believe. Now get this straight. Here's where people mess things up. They believe that if they believe enough and they pray for something that God is going to give it to them. That's not faith. That is faith in the virtue of what you want. That is faith in, 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 in yourself that you are making the right choices. Faith is praying for something, but knowing God is going to do the right thing. That's faith. And I'm going to say something. I know I've, I've said something similar in the past, and it's still true, so I'm going to say it again. Faith and worry cannot coexist. Paul says here in this verse, don't worry, just pray and hand it over to God. That is the KFV, Keith Floyd version. What is the source of that strength? We talk about the source of peace. What is the source of strength? Often quoted, often misunderstood, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now athletes, uh, uh, it has become common to use that verse to say, well, I can, you know, run uh, faster than anyone else because of Christ. I can lift more than anyone else, I can accomplish anything because Christ is in me. All this means is I can do all things that are God's will because of Christ in me. I can do all things through Christ. Now sometimes it is God's will that someone runs faster than someone else. The man in that movie ran faster than everyone else. It put him in a position where his story would be told. It gave him enough notoriety where people would listen to what he had to say. But it was God's purpose that was being used. Paul said in that verse, I. You know what that means? It's personal. Many times we look at other people and say, well, so and so. What a great person of God. What a great man of God. What a great Woman of God, we read about someone like George Mueller and we know that, that he prayed and, and things got done and he ran an orphanage and he took care of children. Uh, one of my favorite stories was his, they, they did not have any milk at the orphanage and he prayed, Lord, we have to get some milk for the children. And the milk truck broke down outside of the orphanage and they said, this milk is going to go to waste. Do you want it? That's not coincidence. But when we, when we read that, that is not someone else. That is us. We have to personalize this verse. That if we get ourselves in the will of God and we seek the things of God, there is nothing that we can't accomplish. He says, I, he says, can do. That's positive. We always talk about a can do attitude. Paul knew positively what God could do through one person. Through one person. I was listening uh, on my trip to Ohio. Uh, I was listening to uh, uh, Daniel Pearson. You might remember Brother Pearson was here, uh, preached last summer. He's one of the, the preachers, and he was preaching a sermon that he uh, called The Power of One. And what God can do through just one person. It's positive. It's we can do these things. What things can we do? All things. That means it's plentiful. Anything that God would require us to do. But many times we don't go out and witness. Why don't we witness to people? Because we're worried that we will mess it up. That we will do it wrong. Paul says, I can do all things. That means that you can go out and witness to people. And you can lead others to Christ. 
Doesn't matter what the ministry is. Doesn't matter what the calling is. It is plentiful. It says through Christ, it is powerful. It is not your power that you endeavor to do these things. It is the power of Jesus. It is easy to doubt yourself. But how can you ever doubt Jesus? The one who defeated sin, death, and hell. How can you doubt Jesus? Because he is the one that is empowered for you. Which strengthens. That means it's potent. We always talk about the, 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 uh, the, the parable, the impotent man, how he was lame and he couldn't make it into the pool there at Bethesda. And uh, uh, we use that word impotent meaning having no strength. But Paul says we have all strength. We are potent because Christ strengthens us. And once again, he uses the personal word, me. That means it's poignant. Poignant means it's, it's meaningful. It's meaningful to you. Once again, and we're not talking about someone else. This is something that any Christian can apply to their life. So let's finally look at the stronghold of peace. Back in our text, the peace of God which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. What is the stronghold of peace? He says it's in our hearts. The peace of God shall keep your hearts. What, it, what does he mean your hearts? Is he talking about that organ that pumps blood? No, what he's talking about is the way we feel. Uh, our feelings that we have, we feel the peace of God about us. When we understand that we can do all things through Him, when we, uh, when we meditate on the things that are important, when we go out and we do good in our hearts. The Apostle John talks about in his first epistle about people's hearts condemning them. But when we have the peace of God, because we're trusting in Him, we're praying to Him, our faith is in Him, our strength is in Him, and all, uh, He is our all in all. The stronghold of peace is in our heart. We feel it. It's not only in our heart. We're, what else does it say? In our minds. We have what we feel and we have what we think or what we know. You know, we talk about faith so much. We talk about faith so much. Just, just believing in what's unseen. I know that every word in this Bible is true. I have the peace of God. I know that if I were to die tonight, I would be in the Lord's presence. That is the peace of God. I know that if I preach the gospel, someone, somewhere, at some time will be saved. There's an old story about uh, Spurgeon back in the day that uh, there was a preacher in his area and he had a small church and it wasn't flourishing. And uh, he asked Spurgeon, he said, you know, when you preach, people are always getting saved. He said, well, do you believe that every time you preach, someone's going to get saved? And this is man said, well, no. He said, that's the problem. That's the problem. It is our job to share the gospel. It is God's job to save people. If no one ever gets saved, that's not my job. My job is to be faithful to preach the gospel. Men get discouraged because they don't see the results that they want.
And why should we be satisfied with one person getting saved a year, a month, a week? No, it's never enough. I never say, oh, that's good enough. Let's just stop there. Now I was noticing in our scriptures that Paul keeps bringing up the term. There's a couple of times he brings it up. And there's three times, actually, that we didn't discuss the one. Either through Christ or through Christ Jesus. It's all through Christ. Philippians 3, 9. And I'm just going to tack this on just as a little extra. You guys don't have anywhere else to go tonight, do you? Philippians 3, 9. It says, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ and the righteousness which is of God by faith. He said it is through the faith of Christ that he is saved, that he is made righteous. Our salvation is through the faith in Christ. Our serenity is is through Christ. He says in verse 7, we'll read it again, the peace of God which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So we have salvation through Christ. We have the peace of God, our serenity through Christ, and we have our strength through Christ because it says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. The flesh will fail you. You can try to overcome things in the flesh. You will fail. You will lose strength. You will get tired. You will get discouraged. But when you have the peace of God and you lay all your burdens upon Him, that is where you get your peace. That is where you get, as this man that we were speaking of, got the ability to, to pray for his enemies and then his nightmares disappeared. His anger disappeared. His frustration disappeared. His, his dependence on alcohol disappeared. It's because he had the peace of God through Christ. Brother Donald. 